All right, here we go. Happy Friday, everybody. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, we appreciate you being here with us so that we can finish it together. Let me minimize my screen here so I don't have to look at it, and you can just block it if you don't want to see it. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Greg Rands, uh, CEO of Own America, and we get together here every Friday uh, at 3 o'clock Eastern to talk about the big opportunities in the market space that we've all chosen to make at least the next round of our livings in. Um, we do it Fridays, as you know, because you're catching me in my best mood on a Friday, and I think I'm probably catching you maybe in your best mood, if all things being equal. So it puts you in a frame of mind um, that sends you into the weekend thinking big, sends you into the weekend exciting, excited about the fact that you found yourself in the middle of a, a major occurrence, a major shift in the U.S. economy, uh, more specifically the real estate market, more specifically the single-family rental market, but one that is going to present so many opportunities to you and to all of us that if we do it together, uh, it happens faster and we can all sort of help each other dive forward into this awesome market space. Uh, I'm excited today because um, we decided to do something different and every now and then we're going to bring somebody on uh, this broadcast with me and somebody who comes from the sector, somebody who's going to be an interesting person to have you all get to meet, certainly is somebody I found to be really interesting and you know I see him probably four times a year. He's never been to my office. I've never been to his. We meet at the conferences on the circuit. And uh, I think I see him more than I see my own brothers, and which is great. He's a good guy. Um, we get along real well, and I'm very impressed with the things he's doing. And he's always been awfully encouraging about the things that we're doing over here. So um, let me just jump right in and introduce him. He, uh, he's on the line. Bruce, you want to unmute yourself, please? I have. I've already right. un unmuted. This is Bruce McNeilage, the CEO of Kinlock Partners. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Greg. Well, very happy to have you here. You know, Bruce is on a mobile phone. He was not able to be in front of a computer, so he's not going to see the images that I'm putting up on the screen as we go along here. I promised him it's only a couple of slides. He's not missing much. But, Bruce, you'll be happy to know that the image of you that I found online that I chose to share with everybody is the promotional shot from your um, sizzle reel for Mr. Bruce Needs His Money. So it's you looking all mean with your uh, your arms folded, <laughs> with the goatee. Yeah, I look uh, I look like the guy that wants to collect rent from you on uh, on Friday night. <laughs> exactly. So we'll, we'll get to that at the end because it's a, there's a fun story around what this is all about. Uh, but I wanted to bring Bruce on for a lot of reasons because he's an entertaining person. He adds a lot to the conversation. Uh, but Bruce, the image that was on the screen before I went to this one is the one that I always start the, the webinar off with, which is this image of a bunch of fish in a sequence of, of increasing size, a small fish being eaten by a bigger one, being eaten by a bigger one, and on and on, um, until there's a large whale on the end who's eating the biggest fish in front of him. And this is my way of trying to convey the way I see this massive consolidation in the single family rental sector. Um, and the point is, is that there's all kinds of players in this continuum. There's a lot of people leading up to that big whale on the end and for everybody in front of the whale, the whale provides a gravitational pull. The consolidation by these dozen REITs that will wind up being two dozen REITs where, you know, the expectation is, is that a trillion dollars worth of single family real estate is going to change hands as it consolidates up the line to those big whales. And the whole point is that there's so much money to be made and so much work to be done along that uh, cascade effect. Um, and all of us that play in this sector have a massive wind at our back. Um, and so being strategic about how you go about it, not just kind of drifting through it, but being very aware of what's happening, where things, where the winds are blowing and how to position yourself is something that I think you have a great track record doing. So take us back to um, specifically in this new trend that really kind of kicked off in 2010 towards the tail end of the housing crisis. How did you first enter this part of it, and what were you doing back then, Bruce? Sure, Greg. So in about 2005, 2006, I went into the business, and we had 50 houses built, uh, primarily around uh, Middle Tennessee, around the greater Nashville area. And we had them built by some large uh, builders, small builders, local builders. And so in essence, it was a build to rent without me building them just contracting to have them built. And out of the 50 houses, we literally rented 49 uh, and gave the keys to the uh, tenant at closing. We pre-sold them, pre-leased them, and so we did very well 
uh, in 05 and 06, eventually got up to about 60 houses and were fully rented with about a 97% occupancy average uh, for nine years. Uh, after nine years, uh, American Homes to Rent uh, came along, uh, bought us out in, uh, in Middle Tennessee, and that's when I started uh, concentrating my focus on the greater Atlanta market, which had really been beaten up and really uh, uh, had some great opportunities because of the, uh, uh, the implosion of, of Countrywide and some of these other uh, lenders uh, that had uh, aggressively lent to people uh, that had lost their homes, and we came in and started scooping them up in uh, 2010, 2011. So you were doing build to rent. You, you were the first person that I ever heard of that was doing that. In fact, when it first came up, I remember having a conversation with you where I kept asking you, why don't you just sell the houses? I don't get it. Like, if the market's decent, why don't you just sell the houses? Because that's all I'd ever experienced when it came to builders, and you explained to me back then that, Selling a house is great, but it doesn't cash flow, and this is a different business strategy. Um, so it was interesting that you you found a niche there that was really driven by what? By the the existence of builders that had excess supply. Well, I mean, uh, I, I had got up to about six or seven houses myself, uh, having them built and renting them out, and it was going very well. Uh, we were making some some very nice positive cash flow. We didn't have any. Uh, expenses as far as uh, having to fix things, repairs, whatnot. So we didn't really have any issues like CapEx. And we had relatively low interest rates. And I got up to about seven houses myself using my credit and whatnot. And eventually nobody would loan me money anymore. And so I teamed up with a partner out of Fort Lauderdale that I had known for a number of years. He had enough capital and uh, we got a, a number of loans that we were able to get up to about 50 houses uh, within six or nine months. Had them all built very aggressively over about nine months. And like I said, uh, uh, rented them very quick and we were kind of off and running. So I saw the demand for high quality rental houses and saw that people would be willing to pay a premium for a brand new house. And also they would stay in that house longer. I call that a sticky tenant. Because why would you want to leave a brand new house a year or two after uh, you move into it? And I think a great statistic for these houses we built in 05 and 06 is when I sold the portfolio two years ago to American Homes to Rent, 30% of the people were my original tenants from 05 and 06. They literally had lived in these houses uh, nine or ten years, had been the only occupant, and we didn't have to worry about a turn, carpet, paint, it being vacant, uh, roughly one third of our people were uh, were still with us nine years later. <laughs> so I say it's amazing because hearing you explain it, it seems obvious, right? It's one of these things where, well, of course your maintenance costs are going to be practically zilch if everything's brand new, and of course you're going to be able to keep tenants longer, and of course they're going to clamor over each other to get at the new stuff, um, and yet the entire industry until some really early because you were doing this back, you said in two thousand in the early two thousands, mid two thousands. So this was during the housing boom you were doing that, when everybody else was cashing out and trying to keep rolling. It's just really interesting because we had a conversation, uh, my guys in the office today uh, and me, um, about how you think in this day and age everything's been figured out, right? I mean, there's just everything's done. How much innovation? People talk about disrupting. It's a big hot buzz phrase in Silicon Valley, right? Disruptive technology, disruptive businesses and business models. And that presumes that something already exists. Right, that presumes that something mature has gotten soft and maybe uh, complacent, and you can go break it apart, shake it up, disrupt it. And yet, in this space, there are things that haven't even been tried. Right? I mean, was build to rent ever a thing before you were doing it that you are aware uh, of? Okay. I mean, not not that I'm aware of, and, and I I really didn't uh, fall into it. I, I the area I was in. Uh, was very new, new subdivisions, new schools and whatnot. So to buy the product uh, and have them built and have them be brand new, I did know that I would get a premium. I did know that the client would be sticky and I did know that I could borrow money real cheap. And of course, Greg, back then we didn't have the financing vehicles. There weren't the banks that were willing to lend money. So it was very tough to get credit and I certainly would have bought more houses if I had uh, the additional capital to do so. But while I was maturing that portfolio in Nashville, we started buying in 2010 and 2011 in Atlanta 
which created uh, some great opportunities for us because we were doing well in Nashville. And then, uh, of course, we went into the Atlanta market. That's a good segue for the, um, the question I had for you next. So you made your way over to Atlanta, and that was a market that now you were in the middle of the, the feeding frenzy. Um, in the, that was what year did you go over to Atlanta? Late 2000? Uh, 2000, uh, at the end of 2010. Uh, Okay, so you were right in the right in the mix of things. By the time 2012 rolled around, you were David with multiple Goliaths stomping around in your playground there, weren't you? Yeah, and and what we did is I just wanted to build up about 100 or 200 houses like we did in Nashville, borrow the money, cash flow them, and eventually sell the portfolio. Literally within three months of us assembling about 10 to 12 houses, I got a call from a small fund. They bought us out literally three or four months later. Uh, we said we could do it again. They bought us out another three months later. And that first year, we were bought out three times by an institutional buyer. And so I realized pretty quick that I wasn't going to be able to keep a portfolio and build it long time, that really what I was going to do is be a, a professional uh, uh, rehabber, rehab to very uh, high standards, and then in essence, aggregate or offer my portfolios every three or four months to what become what became the big boys when the institutions uh, came in. So that's really how we started in Atlanta. That's awesome. So that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. This idea that there's a continuum of larger and larger players, and there's so much opportunity in the mix there. As an example, you mentioned you got bought out one time, two times, three times, and then all of a sudden it became a almost like a rhythm that you got into. How big were those portfolios that you were aggregating and rolling up to a larger player? So uh, traditionally, it was about 10 at a time, and then it became 20, and then it became 30. But there were a lot of times where I was in between sales, and you know, new operators came into the market. I had raised capital, uh, were, were much bigger than us, maybe 500 to 1,000 houses. And so I would sell five at a time to them, and then build up a portfolio, and, and the big boys would buy me out one time, the small guys would buy me out another time. But during that uh, five or six years, uh, up until last year, I guess, about five and a half years, we've been bought out 11 times uh, since we started in Atlanta by some of the big boys, some of the smaller guys. But we turned about 500 houses uh, in that five and a half to six years. Turned five and a half? I'm sorry. I said five and a half. We turned 500. We, 500. we bought, okay, renovated, and sold about 500 houses. That's amazing. And so you're, the profitability, are, now are, were a lot of these were rehabs, were any of them brand new builds or they were all? Well, most of them were built in 06 and 07. So when we were buying them in 10 and 11, many of them were the models, the first four houses in the neighborhood. They were brand new, never been lived in. Uh, we might have had to put uh, appliances in because they were stolen or maybe the outside air conditioning condenser. We had to put about three or 4,000 into each house. But when we originally started buying these houses, they were four bedroom houses, uh, 2,000 square feet, and Greg, our first two purchases were 38,000 apiece. Uh, these awesome. are houses that were going for between 175 and 225,000. And we were getting them at 38. Let's see, the second one was 38. I remember the third one was 40. And the nicest house we bought those first couple of weeks, uh, we paid 56,000 for. But it had sold for three hundred and twenty thousand just a couple years ago. So that gives you a flavor for how beat up the Atlanta market was uh, comparatively to the rest of the country. So some of those were undoubtedly subdivisions that weren't going to be completed, where a builder was defaulting on their debt and getting the heck out of Dodge. And these were a couple of remnant houses they had they wanted to get rid of. Yeah, I would say most of the neighborhoods were about fifty percent complete. Uh, they had PVC farms, which is I call, which is just overgrown lots with PV, uh, PVC sticking out. Many of them had uh, playgrounds. Many of them had pools that were operational. Uh, but but you drive in some of these neighborhoods, there weren't too many lights on, and we were buying the first three four houses in the neighborhood that anybody had touched uh, since people lost uh, their houses, and we were making them new. And so they were pretty easy to rent out. But I can tell you, we were the first ones to go into some of these neighborhoods. And so we really didn't know uh, how it would turn out, uh, what the demand for uh, rentals would be. But if you think about it, most people lost their houses due to foreclosure, due to short sales, 
and those people still wanted to live in the neighborhood or live in houses. So we were, you know, buying houses and making them new and then renting them back to many people that had lost them uh, the year or two uh, before that. That's great. It reminds me of something that we um, we kind of made a little bit of a name for ourselves back during that those same years, doing something totally different. Our um, the opportunity that we saw with some of these large players that were coming along and, and putting in uh, putting a lot of capital out to buy vacant homes on the MLS. So we never had the contacts to be, um, you know, look at finding distressed properties. We didn't seek the the field operation to go into the auctions. We believe that based upon the kind of yields that the people we were talking to were looking for, that and the kind of capital they had to put out there, and one of the ways they were going to do it was MLS acquisitions. And um, we started to do research on where we thought they should go. They would say, we want to go to, you know, Charlotte, Atlanta, New Orleans, not New Orleans, I'm saying that for, um, Jacksonville, Orlando. And we would try to dig in and identify the neighborhood level um, kind of analysis that would get their attention, right? So we're a real estate network. We can acquire the property, but what's the extra value add that we offer? Technology, what's the other one? Some insight into the market. And one of the things that struck us early on was what you just said. People, people during the housing crisis focused on the distress the families were feeling financially. Right? They got a monkey on their back. They owe $300,000 on a house that's $250,000 and, and, and coming down in terms of value. And they were looking for a way out. But as soon as they got out, as soon as that foreclosure, they bit the bolt and dealt with it. Or as soon as they got that short sale dealt with, the second thing they were concerned about, and it was right there next to it, was keeping their kids shielding their kids from impact of this. And that means same classroom. You know, different bus stop is okay, but same classroom was an imperative. And so you obviously identified the same thing. We, we went in and looked for places where you could identify a ratio of distressed property, foreclosures, pre-foreclosures, and short sales, and then compare it to the amount of um, available rentals in that market. And we would find four and five to one ratios. So four and five families in a, in a school district facing foreclosure or short sale right now for every one available rental in that school district. And that screamed to us, elevation in rents. People are going to compete for these rentals. They want to stay. And it wound up working out. Um, and so that's, you know, the, 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 the point that I want to get across to the folks that join us each week is we want you to see that if you're creative, look around and see what's happening in front of you. When you do that in a boring, old, mature, settled industry, it almost feels like like the traditional real estate business, right? The company I used to run was a traditional real estate brokerage. And you're out there competing against everybody else, doing it basically the same way, just marginally better. Uh, different color logo, different kind of training program, different kind of website, all had the same stuff. And it's almost like you're waiting for something to fall off the table, a scrap, you know? Um, or you got to go in there and fight over a piece of business, where over here there's so much activity. So much stuff going on that nobody has any freaking idea what they're doing, and everybody is figuring it out for themselves as they go. Like you had to figure out buy, uh, build to rent, right? Then you figured out how to get out there and deal with you know all these big players in Atlanta, where all of a sudden you were surrounded by people with more capital, and you found a different business plan. <clears throat> and by the way, Bruce, I told you, you don't, you can't see the graphic on the screen. I looked for a funny picture of David and Goliath, and I figured I'd find one that had like a cartoon rendition of David and Goliath, and what I found instead is a picture of a giant, big, fat sumo wrestler and a little skinny guy wrestling him. And, and <laughs> I guess I chose it. I wanted to make you laugh because the guy who was supposed to be like, you're David, right? So you're the little guy in this, in this uh, analogy. Um, he's wearing a loincloth, you know. <laughs> he's, he's got the little, the little sumo diaper on and he's wrestling with this big, gigantic guy. So you're not going to get a laugh out of it, but hopefully the people that are watching um, get the joke. Um, well, I, I think your point's well taken. You don't have to be large. We, you know, we were obviously small. You don't have to be large to, to deal with the big institutional buyers. It may be a little, uh, you know, maybe a little, I guess, scary at first, uh, but, but what you find out is you're all very similar. You're looking to deploy capital. You have to make a certain rate of return. You know, they have these things called algorithms and matrices. And the big boys are looking for the same thing you're, you're doing, and that's, you know, clean uh, houses, relatively new, no capex in neighborhoods where they can get good rents. And what we found is we almost became an acquisition arm of some of these larger companies because we were aggravating, uh, aggregating, excuse me, 10, 20, 30, 50 houses at a time, 
and they didn't have to pay for uh, benefits, salaries, things like that. We literally were working for some of the different companies with regards to aggregating, and they were willing to pay a premium because we did a very good job rehabbing houses. I always told my partners, I want to rehab a house as if it's going to be mine, because quite frankly, if we don't sell it, it would be ours for, be for a long time. And I wanted to pick a tenant that we would be comfortable with, because again, if I didn't sell them, uh, I wanted to feel comfortable with the with the tenant, and I didn't want to sell a fund, a package of goods, because quite frankly, if I didn't do a good job on the rehab, if I picked tenants that were not going to pay, and I just uh, sold those to a fund, I would never be able to sell those to that fund again, and not only would I not be able to sell those to that institutional buyer, you know, word gets out, uh, these different meetings, these different acquisition guys, I wouldn't have been able to stay in the business as far as someone that is is buying my, my product. And I think what we're most proud of is every company that has bought our product has come back to us or has said, you know, we really liked your product. And, uh, you know, we, we felt we got a very fair deal because you were providing uh, such high quality houses. That's awesome. You know, that fits in again with what, what I've talked about here before, which is that in the SFR industry, everybody – um, had a first act and everybody was forced to figure out their second act. You know what I mean by that? Like you've been in this and so you know a lot of the faces have remained the same but the business cards have changed at our conferences, haven't they? Sure. Oh, absolutely. And, and guys that I was working with that might have been uh, assistant vice presidents at one company are now senior vice presidents at acquisitions at others. Uh, guys that were with small outfits uh, buying a few hundred houses a year are now with you know publicly traded companies, and the good thing is we all kind of were working uh, uh, together when this, this was really in its infancy. But you know by meeting at meetings, by by being parts of of these groups, you're able to form relationships that a helps you sell your houses, but b it helps these institutions grow because they know you can provide a predictable stream of houses at a given price with a given cap rate with high quality tenants with no capex and you now become very important to those institutions so the um, it's this is what you're doing now then right so in terms of what we talked about what got you into this years ago and how you evolved is this the is this the foreseeable future right now for you uh, continuing to crank these um, these portfolios and roll them up the chain to the bigger players well, what we've seen is really like a bell curve. Initially, 05, 06, we were building brand new houses and renting them out to people. Then we got such good deals in uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, we stopped buying brand new houses because we were buying houses at $17 a foot, $20 a foot, whatnot, and getting very good rents. We were uh, making roughly a 22 to 24% gross cap rate. Why would I build new houses when I could buy like new houses and make them new houses? So we got out of the, uh, the build to rent business for a few years. We got in the rehabbing business of high quality rental houses, selling them to funds. And now we've kind of come full circle. All we're doing right now, because most of the low hanging fruit is gone. Uh, the foreclosures, the short sales, the stuff guys were buying 50, 100, 200 houses at a time at auctions, that's all gone. So you're right, Greg, we have to reinvent ourselves and constantly look for, you know, what's the next trend. And we're back to building and buying brand new rental houses from major players, getting concessions, and then really getting deep uh, by width and breadth in neighborhoods and zip codes where if you want to rent a house in a certain school district, you have to come to us. If you want to rent a house by a certain hospital or, or by Delta Airlines or, or the major employers, we're going to be the, call, uh, the, the, the company you call because we have more high-quality houses than anyone else. And so that's a very attractive thing to a, uh, a company that's looking for product. And when you're buying brand-new rental houses and you sell them one, two, three years from now, you're probably selling them with a high-quality tenant that's a known commodity. The house still has very little capex. Uh, you're turning over a very nice asset, very good school district, and you're turning over 5, 10, 20 houses in a neighborhood, which really allows you to, to dominate the local market, set the, uh, set the uh, rental rate, and that's what we're doing right now. We're aggressively doing it in a couple different areas, buying brand new, uh, buying five-bedroom or four-bedroom houses that uh, really rent out of the premium, and we've focused and kind of gone back to where we started. 
where so many other people um, went the route of um, of buying the cheapest stuff they could because they wanted to maximize the yield on paper. And a lot of those people, the decision they made, they ended up unloading those properties. And there, and you and I both know what we're talking about. There are a couple of portfolios that have gone and changed hands like a hot potato by now that people built them, not built the homes, acquired houses, didn't go the quality route. Because that's essentially what you're talking about. You, you're going the, the route of who's the cream of the crop tenant who's willing to pay a little more for the better quality lifestyle, who wants to be in the right neighborhood, who wants the brand new stuff, and who's going to stay there. Um, and that's I, I appreciate that because there was a time in this business that investing in homes equaled buying pieces of junk. Like that was all everybody ever thought it was, you know, or buying pieces of junk with other people's money. In fact, yesterday I went, I took a continuing education class for my North Carolina license, and I took the class four hours on secrets of real estate investing. I figured, what the hell? Let's see what you know. See if I know what I'm talking about. Um, and the end result, <laughs> I don't want to disparage the course because the teacher was a terrific guy. I liked him, but nobody learned anything about investing in real estate. And the gist for the second half of the course was the bigger pockets, other people's money, getting rich in real estate. You don't have to have any of your own money if you learn these techniques just by this program. You know, he wasn't selling a program, but it just goes to show that you know if you could have, if you were opening a car dealership, and you could have the dealership for the Ford F-150s, which is the one that sells all the cars around here, or you could have the dealership for the cheapest, lightest weight pieces of junk out there. If you have your choice, which way you want to go, you chose to be in houses you can be proud of with tenants that you knew were going to take care of the places and treat you well. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you're going full circle because now I've got on the screen here, I just did a quick search this morning for recent stories about Bill Torrent and Builder Magazine online. Um, story why Bill Torrent is still a market strategy. It's, Bill Torrent was only like a couple of years old, and they're referring to it as now something that's still got legs. Do you think it's got? I mean, is this a permanent thing? Is this part of the home building industry in perpetuity now? Well, I was, you know, obviously one of the first to get in in 05, 06. I, I really didn't plan on being a pioneer or a trendsetter, and I didn't, you know, expect to be bought out by a New York Stock Exchange traded company. I mean, you know, relatively you know, small or medium-sized operator. So that gave me the, the confidence, certainly gave me the cash to go out and do what I do. But it absolutely, I don't even think it's in its infancy. I think we're literally, even though I've been in it 10, 12 years, I, I literally think we're on the front end of it and it's only going to get better because, again, you don't have the foreclosures. Uh, a lot of the marginal stuff and, and the cheap stuff is all gone. It might be trading the second or third time, but that's all gone. So really, it leaves a uh, newer product. And you can get concessions from builders. Uh, you can go into neighborhoods and whatnot. But what, I start, what I'm starting to see, which is a phenomenal concept, is where companies are going in and they're buying the entire subdivision, uh, doing a build to rent, and they, they are running it like a horizontal uh, apartment complex. You, yep. you aren't going vertical. They're all single family houses. You can sell them off in the future one on one, but they're providing services like a, a repairman or, or laundry facility or amenities like a pool and clubhouse. It's like living in an apartment complex, but you have four walls of your own, a garage of your own, and they're in a good, good school district or whatnot. So in, in, a, in addition to guys like me, you know, buying five or 10 new houses in a neighborhood, buying 50 or 100 and making your own subdivision or buying one portion of a large master plan community back in the corner or up at the front, I think not only is a great, great business model, I think you will see more and more companies get into it, but I think you'll see more builders do it. There'll be guys like us, but I think builders are looking at how good our business is, that it's in the infancy, that they can borrow money uh, at, at very cheap rates builders are going to get in this business as well as people like us that are going to increase uh, the business. But but the build to rent, I think, is, is not only the wave of the past, it literally, I believe, is one of the best places to be in the SFR business. The, the yields are a little more, but Greg, you brought up a very good point. You can buy garbage and you can uh, put lipstick on a pig, but at the end of the day, if you buy the cheapest stuff, you lower the price of it, you're going to get a different quality tenant. And if you have 97% occupancy, you might have 97% of the assets full, but you only are collecting 80% of the money. 
And so you have an economic vacancy and you have a, a physical vacancy. And when 20% of the people are not paying you, but you bought a bunch of cheap stuff, that's not cash flowing well. So you thought you got a deal, you can't uh, collect the rent. And so a 12 or 15% cap rate was a projected cap rate. And, you know, people sometimes that are trying to sell their portfolio will project cap rates, but unless you're living and, and, and working that portfolio, you don't know if that cap rate is true. What I like about brand new houses is nobody is selling you a bill of goods. You've got a brand new house. You're going to have a higher quality person in it, and the rent is going to be more predictable. The asset is not going to have the cap X, and long term, you're going to have a better cap rate because you're collecting 95, 97% of your rent and your tenant stays longer. With our portfolio, if the tenant stayed for 108 months, we never had a turn, carpet, paint, Mr. Uh, rent payment. If your tenant stays for 108 months, 48 months, 36 months without a turn, that's more profitable than trying to buy something cheap and, and just hoping uh, it turns out to be a better investment. Right. It's not just quality and settling. It's quality and the reality of having a high quality experience actually makes you more money and the value of the asset goes up faster and it makes sense. Well, the, inst the institutions want to buy a high quality asset. The institutions don't want uh, a lot of cap uh, capex. The institutions realize quality and they will have a tendency of going towards the quality operators where the people that buy the older vintages, uh, the cheaper stuff in sub-tier markets with poor schools, they're going to have to keep it or they're going to have to wholesale it or get rid of it because long term it will not produce the cash flows that it was projected and, and it's not going to be a good asset for an institution or a smaller operator. And it was it, when you mentioned builders instead of home building companies, I, I like that because when I, when I was up in the New York suburbs, we had a very robust new development marketing division representing builders in the suburbs. And, uh, and you talked about the experience you, you found, you know, 50% sold subdivisions with a couple of models and you, you grab them up for a great price. And what happens, what happens to a builder is the music stops sometimes and it stops at the wrong time. Like in, you're in between. And so builders have, when times are good, they're rolling in it. But all of a sudden, if the music stops and they don't have a chair, they wind up having to wrap everything up and they give a lot of it back and they go through some really hard times. And it's, it's one of the craziest roller coasters I've ever witnessed close up because when times are good, they are on top of the world. And all of a sudden, it just craps the bed and they're out of luck. A lot of those, a lot of builders I know who wind up having to duck and cover and, um, and sell their own homes, you know what I mean? Like it gets really bad for some of these guys. Um, if they could have held on to one out of every three homes they've ever built as a rental, didn't cash out of it, held on to it and rented it, and then when the S hits the fan, they had 30, 40, or 75 homes that were paying them rent because they kept some of their subdivisions for themselves. I don't know a builder who wouldn't have been, who doesn't wish they had done that so they've got a buffer and an insurance policy against the inevitable turns in the market that could come. Well, and your point's well taken. Where we were able to take advantage of the market is we found those builders that were over the barrel. They didn't understand the rental market, so they were willing to sell houses to us at a loss, we got a brand new house, but then we in turn were able to rent it because we knew the rental market. Uh, the house is appraised at a higher number, so we were able to uh, do cash out refinances or borrow more money. And we knew that if we could keep the place clean, keep it rented, it would go up in value. Uh, and we started, of course, at a lower point. That builder walked away with less money and, and that was his curse, but buying it from the builder was our blessing. And, and like you said, sooner or later, the asset will go up in value. We just wanted it to go up in value on our side of the ledger. And unfortunately for them, it, it, it went down and they lost money on their side of the ledger. Yep. And so I, I, I agree with you that this is a long-term thing, and I'm even more convinced that build to rent is going to attract a lot of builders, if not the entire strategy. A lot of them it will be part of their strategy to create that sort of layer of insurance um, and uh, it's, it's one of these things that I say this a lot to the guys at the office, that there are so many things about this that are going to happen because they should. They make sense. It's not like you have to create a market for something or you have to roll the dice of something risky. These are things that make so much sense it hurts. It's just that nobody's done them before. 
Um, and so, you know, kudos to you for having figured it out early, and I'm glad that you're getting, uh, you're getting credit for that. And that's a good segue before we wrap up. I wanted to, uh, I told everybody in the beginning that about um, Mr. Bruce needs his money. And I'm going to try this. I've, I've got it on the screen here. I'm going to try to play the YouTube, the sizzle reel. Anybody who's been near the show business uh, world knows that a sizzle reel is what you create when you're promoting a show. And so this has not gotten picked up yet. Um, I understand, but I want to show the uh, the people on the webinar. Mr. Bruce needs his money. The uh, potentially up and coming reality show. My name is Bruce McNeilage, and I'm the toughest landlord in America. <laughs> it's Bruce, the landlord. Bruce needs his money because that's how business works. I'm not a not-for-profit corporation. It's tough work, and I'm trying to make as much profit on a monthly basis as possible. He has a bull in a china shop. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Which two properties are you calling? He Bruce. tries to comfort me by telling me that he's always got a gun on his hip, but so do a lot of other people. The people that don't like me are the people that don't pay. I need the rent. I don't have anything for you. I have dogs that aren't supposed to. Is that that dog you don't have? That's not nice. I want to be treated with respect, but I want my money. I need my money. What are you prepared to commit to make this right? What did you want? Can I have three thousand dollars today? I kicked calls in there. They stole the oh, Keep coming. Chris. Chris and I met. All right, I'll pause it there. I hope you you guys could hear that well. If you can't, do yourself a favor and, and do a quick Google search or a YouTube search for Mr. Bruce needs his money. Looks like a hysterical. Bruce, what's happening with that? You've got it in front of some people. You think he's got a check? So. Yeah, so I was signed to a uh, a contract, a production deal by uh, a, a company that uh, found me on YouTube, uh, saw uh, the type of work I was doing in some economically uh, challenged areas of Atlanta. Uh, they saw, you know, my type of personality. They signed me to a contract. We have had a lot of um, interest. We haven't signed an offer. I was offered a a flipping show, but you know, everybody's doing a flipping show. And uh, I had no interest in the flipping show. And I, I explained to him the, the show was some cross between uh, Flip This House and Dog the Bounty Hunter. Uh, and truthfully, there was no acting in that. Uh, that was They were following me around for a couple of days. That was kind of the, the uh, uh, areas that I'm, I'm trying to get out of now, but were lucrative. And uh, I had uh, things happen to me on a daily basis. Uh, uh, we'd find people living in old houses. We found... Uh, we found a lot of things behind door number one and door number two, and it was really uh, interesting. And so I was signed to a contract, and uh, uh, you know we've got some people looking at it. That's awesome. Well, I will watch it. I was laughing hysterically when I saw this, and not because I knew you, because it was just um, – it, it's definitely a fit. So this is another one of those things that I believe will happen because it should, because the world's full of smart people, and there are going to be enough of them that see this and say there's definitely an audience – Listen, we have a president right now, love him or hate him, who got his who cut his teeth in show business, being a tough guy businessman. You know, tough guy businessmen are the thing on television right now. Whether it's the bar rescue guy who yells at you for having you know rat droppings in your kitchen, or the uh, the prophet, or you know Shark Tank. So this thing fits in with the the lexicon today, and I really wish you a lot of luck. I hope it, it gets picked up and runs for a few years. I, hey, I appreciate it. I would also tell people to check out my Dodge truck commercial. They could just uh, Google Mr. Bruce uh, Dodge truck or see it on YouTube. But at, you know, at the end of the day, Greg, if we're wrapping up, I, I would tell people this is something that small operators can get into. They can buy one or two houses. Uh, large operators can come in like institutions. But, you know, you can't buy part of an, uh, an apartment complex. You can't buy part of a uh, a, a condo development, but for fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand, they could buy one house. They could go to a company, you know, like yours, and buy ten or twenty houses. But you can start off small, like you said, the small fish, and you can get larger and larger with the reputation and do well. But I truly think that this market isn't even near where it, it should be and where it will be. This is becoming uh, an asset class all itself. Wall Street, uh, Main Street. Everybody is, is looking at this, and it's just going to really be uh, the place to be in the future, in, in my opinion, because you look at the stock market being high, you look at CDs becoming certificates of disappointment, certificates of depreciation, and you can't live, you can't retire on things like that. You have to retire on, on positive cash flow, uh, real estate, things like that, but literally you can pay off 
and it will pay you a predictable income income stream uh, for the rest of your life. And it's something you can pass on. It's something you can sell to an institution. And it really provides people the greatest opportunity to build wealth. Uh, but you can get into it uh, on a very, very uh, small basis. So that that's why I love the business. I also like the financing that's available now. We, we, we have more financing alternatives. And I like the fact that the big boys are still buying houses, they, rec uh, they, they see opportunity, they see the good operators, and it, it, to me it's almost like a partnership. They know what we can do, we know what they need, and we're each helping each other, and, and by us helping each other, it elevates my business, it elevates their business, and so we both, uh, we both are successful. One doesn't have to lose and the other one has to gain. That is a perfect way to wrap this up. Bruce McNeil, CEO of Kenlock Partners, thank you very much for being our first guest on the Touch Base Fridays show. I guess it's a show now because we have a TV celebrity on here. Uh, but thank you. This was great. I hope you have a phenomenal weekend, and, um, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Craig. And to everybody else, thank you. Happy Friday. I hope this was informative. I uh, hope you made a new friend here in Bruce McNeil. Go check out his videos. Um, I'm going to go watch the one on the, the Ford, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Ram truck commercial now. Uh, but think big over the weekend, guys. Um, there's a lot happening and a lot of ways for people with some ingenuity and some a little bit of guts and knowledge of the real estate business. You can make a fortune. So I hope you had a good day. Thank you very much for being here. Have a great weekend.